Welcome to today's author. Today we are privileged to be speaking with a gentleman named Tim Wurzberger. He is the author of In Plain Sight. Tim, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. You got it. I'm excited as well. Let's let's start off um, a little bit about yourself uh, when you're not promoting your debut novel. Yeah, well, uh, Tim Wurzberger, like you said, I was born and raised in Hanson, so I, I love this this hometown connection. Um, bounced around the last couple of years, but I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. My primary job is working in marketing for an agency that specializes in higher ed. And my role is research and writing and SEO, which is search engine optimization, which is really helping. It's the keywords. It's it's being found on Google. It's, that's what we help our clients with. So I love what I do and I love to write. So this book uh, fits right into that. Let's not bury the lead here because you also co-host a podcast called Dropping the Gloves. And you do you do this with the a former NHLer, John Scott, who, if memory serves me correct, was a fan vote in. Uh, and he was the MVP of the 2016 NHL All-Star Game. Um, how did you get involved with that? And can I ask you, and maybe it might be a little too soon to ask, are you a Bruins fan? <laughs> yeah, too soon. I'm still recovering from last night's uh, Game 7 loss. Um, yeah, John, is a, he's a cool guy, and he has a cool story because he was in the NHL. You know, he was a good hockey player, but he was a fighter first and foremost, and that was his role. And so he got voted into the All-Star Game in 2016 as a joke. And it kind of became a, a really feel-good story where he stuck it to the league and went and scored a couple of goals, had his MVP moment with his kids on the ice and everything. So he became kind of a household name um, overnight. And, and so he retired to sleepy little Traverse City, Michigan, northern Michigan, right on the lake uh, where his wife was from. And I moved there in 2018, sort of on a whim. My uncle lived there and I just was ready for a change. I didn't know anyone, didn't have a job. I just figured I'd, I'd figure it out when I get there. And so when I um, interviewed at this marketing agency, the the guy, the CEO heard I, I liked talking. He goes, so you know John Scott? And I'm like, yeah. I used to hate him because he used to fight all the guys on the Bruins. He played for the Sabres. And uh, he goes, yeah, he's my neighbor. He's starting a podcast. And um, so he'd come into the office every so often to do it. And before long, you know, he'd asked me to help prepare. He'd asked me to come on every every once in a while. And then it, suddenly it was every episode. And suddenly he's calling me his co-host. And so it just sort of took off from there. And it's been a lot of fun. It's been, gosh, four, five years now. And it's grown a lot. And we've had a lot of fun doing it. What are your thoughts about the Bruins' early exit from the playoffs after a magnificent year? It's it's one of the biggest disappointments, and I don't say this lightly, in the history of hockey, if not the biggest. When you think about what they did in the regular season and the expectations for this team to go on a deep run, it was cup or nothing, right? No one was thinking about the first round, and you mm. can't get by the team that squeaked into the wild card spot. It's just, it's embarrassing. I I, <laughs> yeah, I was talking about it on the show today. It's almost, it defies logic what they did. Do you believe that there's a curse in winning the President's Trophy? I don't believe in the curse, but there's a there's a common thread is what happens is, well, two things. When you put that when you get that much success in the regular season, there's a lot there's a lot of uh, almost extra miles that goes on the body when you win that many games. And on top of that, you, the expectations are just so high. And you saw it more, more early on in the season in the series, but definitely game seven, the nerves, they're anxious. They're playing not to lose. Right. Rather than playing to win. And so. Um, I don't think it's a curse, but I think it's a, it's a recurring theme, clearly, that, uh, yeah, just the odds are stacked against you when you win that thing. Who do you think is going to ultimately win the Cup, knowing that the Avs are out last year's champ, too? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I would love to see Edmonton go on and win it. Um, you know, a, a Canadian team hasn't won in I don't know how long, 20 years or something. And when you got the best player in the world, two yeah. of them really on the same team, I think that'd be really, really good for the sport. I'm sure that's what the league wants. They want Edmonton versus Toronto final. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see that. Okay. Let's get right into our regular conversation here. When did the idea of writing a book begin? What, what age? Yeah, so 17, and I'm 32 now. So it's been a long time coming. Um, and it's funny because I was I was super into I was always reading a lot as a kid. So it, I guess it's not that surprising, but it didn't really spark the idea to really start writing something until I was a teenager in high school and I was watching that show Lost, which is, you know, huge at the time, 2007-ish. 
And it was just massive. And I just love that style of storytelling where like the scope of it is so big, but there's these, all these different threads that tie together where like, you, you might, did you watch that show back in the day? I did right? here and there. I mean, I would, I would watch part of the first season, part of the second, and then I kind of fell off. Yeah. It's the kind of show where like, you, you gotta, you gotta be glued to the TV for an hour every week and just seeing how like, where does that door in the jungle open up to? And then they're going to try to figure it out. And then they take you away from it for four episodes. You forget about it. And then you bring it right back there at the most opportune time. I just love that like twist and turn suspenseful storytelling. And so I started thinking about that. And around the same time, I read The Da Vinci Code for the first time. And that was sort of like probably the first adult book I read that wasn't like a war novel or whatever it was, I was reading at the time. It was the first like mass mass appeal adult book I was reading for grownups. And so I, I just love that style of storytelling. It's very similar. That suspense, the twist and turns. And so I was like, okay, I, I want to do this. What What is what is the theme? What am I going to come up with? And that's how I came up with basically not too far from what, what I ended up publishing 15 years later. Yeah. So I was going to ask you is, is that, you know, how long has the book been in the works and it, what is the, what is the road to the final project, you know, the final book? What was that like for you? Long. Um, it's funny because it's, you know, it's, it's not linear and it started and stopped many times. And so the, I had this idea for, um, a book about a summer camp and and basically the, all i knew was that like there was some kind of ulterior motive something was going on there beyond what it, it seemed to be and it's very similar to lost in that sense and that i didn't really think about this till more recently but like the secluded summer camp is not that different from an island where like everything happens in this very like defined space and it, it's it's not like it's happening at a high school where there's you can bring in more of the common themes like they're very much as a writer you have to manufacture what happens there because it's a controlled environment and so um i really like that aspect of it and it had its own challenges and so i would write you know actually I, before i started writing i would work on like an outline in a powerpoint deck that i still have somewhere and i would like flesh out some characters and some plot points and like 10 or so chapter ideas and i would bring a buddy home after school and be like hey what do you think? Is this anything? And they would love it. And then I would start writing and then I'd maybe write 40, 50 pages, show my parents, whatever. Um, and then school would happen, life would happen. And then I'd go to college and start again. And and I actually remember writing one of the, the chapters, the whole thing, which for whatever reason never changed. I pretty much kept it without much editing um, on the bus coming home for where I went to school in Manchester, New Hampshire. And so it's just, it started and stopped many times. And it was always in the back of my mind. Even it's like there's a saying that being a writer is like having homework every night for the rest of your life. You know that. And <laughs> yeah. so um, but I, I I, it was just never went away. And every time I revisited it every couple of years, I basically had the same exact reaction was that like, OK, what I wrote in high school, it reads like I wrote it in high school. Like this isn't usable, but the story was solid. Like this is still a story I wanted to tell. And so it wasn't until maybe couple of years after college, 2015 or something, 2014, where I, I took one of those master classes online, like the, the software that you can subscribe to, Him. Uh, not the software, a subscription. And um, there was one from James Patterson, who's a very successful author, obviously. And he his method of outlining really resonated with me, where he said, you, you've got to basically put everything in the outline. It's not just bullet points and like major themes, like, like pour yourself into the outline and then the story will come together. So that's what I tried. And every it's just like paragraph after paragraph, each each chapter its own paragraph. And it had character arcs and plot points and bits of dialogue, if I could think of it. And everything was in there. And you could follow the whole story, even though it wasn't written out. It was probably a 40 page outline. Like it was it was intense. Um but once I had that, I was able to suddenly like move things around and flesh the story out and put all the parts in the right places. And when I actually sat down to write, it was just that much easier because so much of the work had been done already. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, a blurb when I was doing a little research. Um, this is just a, a, a par not paraphrase. I'm reading from the the Good Read uh, website. A project that started when I was a teenager. It's been reimagined, neglected, torn down, and rebuilt many times during that span. So That's exactly lot. right. Yeah, it's a long time. And it's almost, um, someone pointed out to me recently, like 15 years is a long time for anyone, but the 15 year gap from 17 to 32 is just immense because you revisit a couple of years later and like the maturity and growth that happens during that time is just, it's 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 impossible to measure. And so 
um i find myself there are there are still bits of like storytelling or writing that to, at least to me feels like it was written by a teenager i was just never able to shake it all loose but i think that's probably at least part of the charm for me and um yeah it's 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 been a, it's been a good journey so so what was the process like i mean why did it take 15 years did you have did you have writers blocked did you did you come to certain points where it was kind of a dead end you're like oh and yeah i'm not feeling this story you know when it comes to storytelling you want to you want it to be fluid you, you want it to be something that's compelling that you want to you want your your reader to be you know hanging on every word was that what it was for you was a writer's block it was just a matter of you weren't sure of the direction it actually had little to do with the story and more just life you know like moving into boston and, and and going to school and starting a job and hanging out with my friends and the other things just sort of stood in the way or were kind of bringing my uh attention and energy into other places so it wasn't because i was getting frustrated with the story or couldn't figure certain things out it was just time and life pulling me away um but i did know that like once i started fleshing it out more and then i would kind of get some momentum and it's like a snowball right it's like once you get a little bit all of a sudden like the other pieces start to come together and then you get excited and you want to spend more time with it and all of a sudden i'm 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 25 years old and all my friends are going out and I'm spending my Saturday at a desk writing and I'm happy to do it. Like, it's exciting to me. So, Ken, if you are just uh, tuning into this program, we are speaking with Tim Wurzberger. He's the author of In Plain Sight. This is a story of, it's not just one story. It's, there are three stories that are told. The The earliest version, did it feature multiple stories? When did it, when did it evolve to ha- telling three stories that are, somehow intertwined yeah it always had those stories but the i think they were originally meant to um serve as like quick quick little like side trails that would come right back just to give you a glimpse into a character or their past or whatever actually similar to what lost it in that sense but but it became more clear that like there was more to tell in their stories um and it was more compelling to me as a writer and probably hopefully as a reader to like see how they get to that point over the series of chapters instead of just one little glimpse and so it's interesting to me too like thinking about what's happening in the main story at the summer camp where the the teenagers and kids are trying to figure these things out with all the strange things that are happening and then if you read it you can kind of see where like i tried my best to like place what's happening outside the camp or what's happening in these flashbacks kind of hand in hand like these main topics are are related and you kind of piece the start to piece things together but it's always there's a lot of misdirection it's always just, just a little bit just enough to keep you going so the so the three stories are somehow interconnected and you have to find a way to kind of merge them at, at some point in time towards the end of the book what was the difficulty in doing that well, one of the hardest things actually was, and and this is part of the reason that it took so long, is it's a very uh, complex story. And and so it was probably a, a more complex story than I w- should have written for my first ever novel, maybe something more linear and I would have gotten it done quicker. Um, and because that was a challenge, because like, okay, say I figure out that certain thing happens to this character at chapter 23, right? And then I decide, you know what, that would actually fit better a little bit earlier in chapter 14 but now the, the eight chapters in between like there's things that have to be moved because that other thing he wouldn't have learned yet right it's like all these like moving pieces so i move one thing six other things got to go and like oh this character doesn't know that yet i have to read line by line to make sure it all still stays linear and so that that took a while um but again i think the the end product is is better for it you talk about taking a master class uh with james patterson were there any local authors or folks that you might be friends with who who do writing maybe they do short stories that you would go to and and, and ask them and say hey this is what i'm thinking about and, and what do you think and maybe give them a couple of pages to kind of look at did you do any of that to kind of like do uh tests with folks to see how they're how it was driving with with other people who write uh no <laughs> to be honest not with other people who write um local authors i'm a big fan of dennis lehane who's a boston boy originally but um no i i i would only use like friends and family and the idea was like once i had written a a first draft i would show it or even the outline to like two or three people like like very very close friends and then i would kind of take their feedback revise it and spread the circle a little bit bigger to five people that maybe were 
a, a cousin or like a friend of a friend, just not quite as tight each time. So like each time, like I, there's still people who know me, there's still some bias that they're rooting for me. But I, I kind of like each time was a little bit more likely that they were going to be completely honest and not just tell me what I wanted to hear. And, and I found that very valuable. Um, and I probably, you know, looking back, maybe should have gotten more objective feedback early on. But I did do that, um, you know, four or five years ago at this publishing company where I was living in Michigan that I did a professional evaluation. And and so I paid for them to read the book over the course of a month or something. And this woman, this editor gave me like a four or five page evaluation that told me very, like, very actionable feedback. And so like, she told me, you know, what worked, what she loved, what she was most excited and compelled by um, the parts that were either like less engaging or confusing or that she wanted more of. And then like eight or six, you know, examples of, like I said, actionable things that I could correct. And so it was things of like, like shortening it, for example, it was, I had to shorten it 20 or 25%. And that was really hard. And then a lot of like show don't tell you like, okay, you say this thing happens. I want to see that chapter. Like I want to see that scene play out. Like it's important for the characters. Don't just say it in a couple of lines, like show me things like that. And I found that very helpful. And it was also validating in a way too, because it was the first time a professional that didn't know me read it. And she had like only good things to say. And, and, and the things that, that she wanted me to work on were very fixable and very, um, like I said, actionable. So it was, it was easy and it was very validating. Did you seek a publisher or was this something that is self-published? It is self-published. I, I tried looking at publishers early on before I really finished it, um, just to kind of get in front of some people. And I, I didn't really, I mean, it's almost like applying for college or applying for a job. Like they all have their different websites. Some have forms, some have submissions, some want 10 pages, some want two chapters, some want the whole thing, some want one page and a cover. It's like, it's confusing and, and it takes a lot of time and energy and I decided, like, I'm not, I'm just not going to spend that time. You know, it's not that important to me to go find it published. I'd rather get it out there and and then try again, maybe later, or keep writing until you know um, the right things happen. So I did try maybe 20, 20 or so emails over the course of several years. So not very much at all. Let's talk a little bit about character development. What was it like to develop characters, uh, folks who you know would be uh, common in in throughout each story or in specific stories uh, that you were telling in this book? Well, one of the challenges for me, especially as a younger writer, when I was, you know, a teenager and in my twenties was I had a hard time putting myself in the, in the characters' minds. And what I mean by that is like, they were just names and every character was just doing or saying what I would do in that situation. Right. It was hard to be like, okay, what would this, how would this 40 year old woman react versus the 16 year old kid versus this old man? Like it's hard to, it's hard for a teenager to, to, to get in that mindset. And so I kept, I kept having to rewrite stuff and re and, you know, rewrite scenes. And one of the things that, that really helped me was to um, read more books and, and pay attention to like the shows and movies that I was trying to, you know, emulate. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's about, you know, it's a, the main character, the main plot is about teenagers at summer camp. So I'm thinking like, what are the examples like that Stranger Things show on Netflix where there's just a bunch of young kids it, and it's like they're not telling their parents. It, it's grabbing their backpacks and their slingshots and taking on the bad guys. And that's sort of like their their dialogue and their approach to, you know, solving problems and stuff like that was something that I pulled a lot from. And so it was just emulating other examples um, and just again, over the ten of the course of that ten or fifteen years, was just becoming a better writer, becoming more mature, finding my voice, and it helped that I write so much um, in my career, and I kind of developed those things that I was able to apply to the book. So none of the characters per se are, uh, might not be might have elements of, of family, friends that you interact with, and and as far as the book setting, none of them might be similar to like. Camp Kawani might be Camp Boar. You know what I mean? Is, yeah. is there any of anything that is in the book that might be similar to your setting or surroundings throughout your life? Well, yeah, and that's a great example. Camp that was the only camp I knew was Camp Kawani, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so um there's actually early on, probably when we were still in high school, and my, my buddy Ryan wanted to um turn the first 20 or so pages into a pilot episode and go shoot it at Camp Kawani. And so he wrote a script and, and we never did anything with it. But yeah, that for sure probably helped with my imagination of what the camp looked like. And even um, the layout of the camp is not too, in my mind, is very similar to um, the the fields and and the, um, 
I guess the 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 property at Indian Head School in um in Hanson. And so there are little things like that for sure. None of it's super intentional. Um, none of the characters are really modeled after any specific people. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of like subconscious, you know, elements of that in there that that I'm not even aware of, but it was a lot of just imagination to be to be true. Where did the title come from? In plain sight. Is that something that you know, has taken time to develop or has that been the name of the book since day one? No, it wasn't. It was just called Camp Boar or Boar. Um, that's B-O-H-R. Yeah. Um, and so I, I didn't really know. And, and I was kind of, I didn't spend too much time worrying about that. Um, and then early on, there's a title I actually forgot about until I was looking at recently called The Concealed, um, which I, I kind of get what I was trying to do, but it's not a very strong title. And so as I was working through it, I one of my read throughs over the years, I kind of was always in the back of my mind, like look for title inspiration as you're doing your edits. And there's um, there's a pretty revealing scene toward the end where one of the characters reveals that all these things are happening right now in plain sight. And I was like, oh, that's it, light bulb moment. <laughs> um, and, and I looked it up and there's there's definitely been, you know, small books and, and self-published books with that name, but nothing major, no major IP that was out there that I mm. feel like I was poaching from. So I went with it. Okay. What was it like to to have the finished manuscript in your hand ready to send it off to be printed? What was that like? And what was it like to get back the actual book and have it in your hand and go, oh, what a journey? Yeah, you know, I maybe it's just part of just being hard on myself, but I never really felt a sense of accomplishment from from finishing it because I knew there was still so much work. So even when I typed the last word of the last chapter, like I knew I was still probably only halfway through from what it actually had to be published and everything. Um, and even with the printing or before the printing, but the actual manuscript, I just, it never felt finished. It never felt like I accomplished anything yet. I'm like, it's just words on paper. Anyone could get this far. And so um, I think it probably wasn't until I had the physical copy and I was able to hold it in my hand and look at the, the colors of the, on the cover and re flip through the chapters and read the back where it's like, okay, this is just getting to this point. Even if no one buys it is something that not many people can say they've done. So I was, I was pretty proud of that. So have, has anybody bought the book? Do you have people who are buying it and giving you their, their thoughts on your finished product? Yeah. So I uh, bought 500 copies and I shipped them to myself and got a, a, a label printer and I made a little website. I just wanted to kind of do it. I'll do Amazon eventually at some point, but I've got those skills and I wanted to do it myself. And so, and I also, you know, keep the, um, the, the margins as, as fat as I could on these books. And so I did all that and I sold just maybe a little over 300 so far. And I, I kind of knew that I would sell a lot quick because so many people in my life I lived in a few different places. I've worked in places. So I kind of knew that people were waiting for it and they knew it was coming. So I, in the first two weeks, I sold like probably 150 to 200 copies. And then it sort of slowed down. And then it takes like a little bit of marketing and promotion and emails and reminding people and LinkedIn posts and all that stuff. But that's that's my specialty. That's what I do. That's what I love to do. So my goal is to, to once I sell out these 500, is to um, then put it on, on online to be shipped, to drop ship through Amazon or something like that. Again, if you're just tuning in, we are speaking with Tim Wurzberger. He is the author of In Plain Sight. Uh, if folks want to purchase this book, uh, is there a way, are you selling them on, on a website or can they contact you through social media? What's the process? Yeah, um, actually, if you go to timwurzberger.com, that's T-I-M-W-I-R-Z-B-U-R-G-E-R, timwurzberger.com, or if you just Google me, you'll find it. Um, and that's got a, a nice landing page, web page where you can order it. You can place your order. You can, you know, process shipping and all that. And you can, um, I'll sign it if you want. There's a note. There's a note there. You can check there. And so, yeah, that's how people are finding it. Um, I'm on Instagram too at twurzberger. And yeah, I'm having a lot of fun promoting it. Are you feeling that that you've put so much effort into this that this this is it for for writing books or have you pondered yet another book? Yes, yeah, and um, I've already started. Uh, there's an so actually one of the things that I was doing that was part of the reason it took so long is I would I would get away from this book for a year or two and say okay maybe I'm not I'm not finding my stride yet maybe if I try another story or something and so I've started other other stories and I've got my next book kind of lined up. Um, pretty well fleshed out and outlined um, and probably even, I don't know, 30 or 40 pages written. So 
it's not a sequel, unrelated story, but yeah, it is coming. Hopefully my goal is to finish the outline this year and hopefully publish next year. If there is a young author out there who who might have been like you were at 17 years old and is like, I think I want to write a book. Someone who is is young and they're pondering it. Do you have any advice to give back to those? I mean, knowing that you have finished this book, it's it's a heck of an achievement. What would you share for advice? Uh, two things. Uh, there's a great quote by, I believe, Ira Glass, who, who's got it. He's, he, they talk about um, being a, a young writer, really any kind of like creative uh, outlet is your your brain and and your your level of taste will progress a lot faster than your ability to live up to that taste and so people get frustrated like i i want to listen i want to play the music i listen to but i can't because i'm not good at it yet i want to write as well as the books that i read but i can't because i have not good at it yet until they stop and so i remember that really resonated with, with me to like put the hours in put the time in like you will get there and so um i would go find that quote and i'm sure it'll resonate with you too and then the other thing I would say, it's very simple. And I, again, something that I read online, but there's a word for writers who don't give up and that word is published. So it's as simple as that sometimes. Well, Tim, I want to thank you so much for being my guest and talking about your new book in plain sight. Thank you so much for coming, having me on. This has been a lot of fun. He is Tim Wisberger. Uh, if you have a chance, check out the book. Uh, as he says, uh, he will be getting it up on Amazon soon. You have been tuned into today's author. And until next time, have yourself a great day.